Tan saying good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Garnet Jones, and I am the lead for Indigenous Initiatives at the Canada Media Fund and Tele Telefilm Canada. Um, I would like to start us off um, by having each of the, the representatives from the different teams from these shows introduce themselves, um, starting with uh, the team from Trickster. I'm Elise Cousineau. I'm the VP of Development at Sienna Films, and I'm a co-producer on Trickster. I'm Gail Maurice, and I play Georgina, uh, one of the ancients on Trickster, and... Yeah, it's, it's been an amazing uh, experience for sure. Excellent. And I know that we've got a, a clip from the show. And just before we um, take a look at that clip, I'm wondering if you could just tell us what, uh, what Trickster is and kind of set up that clip for us. Trickster is based on a trilogy of novels by Eden Robinson, and they follow, uh, the story follows a teenage boy named Jared, who's already pretty complicated life, sort of turns chaotic when he starts seeing strange things, things like doppelgangers, um, talking ravens, and skin monsters. Amazing. Okay, well, let's um, take a look at a clip from the show, and then um, we'll meet the others on the panel, and then we'll start talking about the content. So uh, if you could hit the clip and go. Jared, your life belongs to no one but you. You can do better, Jared. I want you to see the guidance counselor. How are things? You know, same. How's home? Mom, these are my friends. I'll show you how to play a real drinking game. <laughs> Girl. And just because I'm not an activist doesn't mean I don't care. There's just so much to care about. Just think what you could do if you actually applied yourself. Hi, welcome to the Tasty Bucket. Can I take order, please? Extra salty fries. Tell me about the night I was born. Get me my baby! I saw something weird last night. You're not real, I'm tripping. You're not real. I'm tripping. Crazy's hereditary, right? You! Oh. What are you doing? How do you know Wade again? He's my dad's friend. Is that what he told you, Jared? What are you? I was gonna tell you when the time was right. A trickster. A trickster? What's he want then? Guess we better find out. Time is almost up. Fighting it only makes it worse. Now close your eyes. Where do you see yourself in five years? All right, so uh, Elise and Gail, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about where uh, Trickster is at in terms of its release. And I, I know that it's um, uh, recently pre uh, premiered. So if you could tell us a little bit about how the reception has been in Canada. Um, yeah, Trickster um, is currently on air in Canada. Um, it's also started airing just recently in Australia and soon we'll be out in territories including Russia and the UK and in the new year in the US. So we're really excited about, about that. Um, I think uh, Gail can speak to this too. I'm really excited about the reception that it's getting um, in Canada so far. People are really excited about the show um, and people, people are watching and um, it's been really great to see on social media that the people who are watching are really engaged and, um, and wanting to, you know, open a conversation about the show and looking forward to the next season. Yeah, no, it's been really exciting. There's a huge uh, Twitter presence, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and uh, there's hashtags, hashtag Trickster. There's been um, uh, Zoom watch parties and Q and A's and uh, the response and the people attending those parties have been, uh, quite outstanding. The questions that they ask 
have been um, just, you know, they, they're they paying attention and they're excited. Uh, they, they're, most of them are saying they have never seen anything like this, uh, you know, representation on, on uh, TV. And I love that they equate it to uh, the indigenous uh, Stranger Things because I love Stranger Things. So it, it's, 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 uh, it's really exciting uh, as an actor um, he, seeing and hearing all of that response. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm so, I'm so proud of the, everybody who worked on it, like Michelle and, you know, and all the creatives. It's just, it's, it was just a blessing just to be part of it. And then all of a sudden to see all this fruition come to life, it's like, yeah, it's, it's great. Absolutely. Well, I think that everybody who's here on the panel today is part of this incredible wave of Indigenous cinema and television and storytelling um, that's really been gathering a ton of momentum over the last really five years or so. So um, maybe with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Jen. Jen, can you uh, introduce yourselves, yourself and talk a little bit about uh, your show, Unsettled? My name is Jennifer Podemski. I am a writer, producer, director, and uh, Unsettled is a television series, dramatic television series, that is, it's no frills. It's a pretty low budget drama series about a woman who reconnects with her community after many, many years, her entire life of living in the mainstream as a 60 scoop survivor, uh, returning home to a community and accidentally has to stay there for circumstances beyond her control. And it's sort of the story that unfolds um, in a fish out of water sort of scenario with her and her family moving from Toronto to a Northern community and making, making a go of it. Um, this was shot in North Bay similar to Trickster in and around the time of Trickster, but uh, a very different kind of show. It's, it's, it's really like I've seen Trickster and I've seen Tribal and it's just, I'm happy about this panel because these are three very, very different shows, which is such an exciting thing for Indigenous mm -hmm. television. Absolutely. And you are at a, like kind of the nail biting stage of production where you've, you know, gone through through production and you're in post right now and yeah. you're getting ready to be released, but you still, you don't know what the audience reception is going to be like and, yeah. and, and all of that. So um, when will the show uh, premiere? Well, our broadcast partners are TVO and ABTN. And yes, we are currently in the post-production process. It's a massive, massive undertaking because we are also um, an Ojibwe language production. So mm -hmm we are now in the process of dubbing the entire series as we're locking it in English into the Ojibwe language. So, you know, I would love to say that we are slated to be delivering this, you know, in early 2021, but I honestly have no idea. I think we just have to, you know, edit and finish the best show possible. We were shut down <clears throat> during COVID with 10 days left to shoot. So we um, had to sort of, I guess, the team stumbled along and pushed through whatever protocols were lifted or whatever, yeah, protocols were lifted in the fall and we finally have wrapped. That's such an amazing uh, piece of time to have lived through and made, made a show through. So congratulations on that. Um, so I'm wondering now if we could move to uh, the team and, and because, sorry, I didn't say we don't have a clip from you because um, you're still at an early stage of production. I don't have a so clip. Unfortunately, we don't get I don't to see anything. I don't have a clip for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, we'll get a uh, chance to talk more about the show in a little bit. So I'm wondering if uh, Ron and Janet, if you could introduce yourselves and tell us about Tribal. Sure. Uh, my name is Ron Scott. I am the creator, uh, executive producer, and uh, director of Tribal, which is a one-hour drama uh, based on... Um, a tribal police is taken over by the federal government and, and kind of a throwback to colonialism on, uh, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of the show is that um, the government always seems to know what's best for the people of the community. And, uh, and so we have this very interesting kind of uh, play uh, when it comes to uh, communicating uh, issues that are based within the tribal community. So Tribal police is actually taken from the um, from the reserve and placed in the city, and so any crime in the city or in uh, on the reserve is the tribal police's responsibility. 
And so basically we have this, you know, female protagonist who decides that, um, you know, she's going to, she's going to do a good job and take down the old boys club. And uh, she has, you know, run-ins with all, you know, different types of detectives and police. And meanwhile, we have a crime of the week. So it's very set up, very pro serial. Uh, and um, yeah, we've got great response from it. And uh, I'll turn it over to Janet, who's our co-executive producer. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Janet Hamley. I'm the co-executive producer on the series. And, you know, I just wanted to reiterate a little bit of what Ron said is just that our series is um, one of the first television series that's focusing on uh, a strong indigenous lead character um, and the obstacles that she's overcome. And we're really proud to tell indigenous stories that are, you know, researched, um, true and um, enticing. I think it really draws in our audience and we're really proud to be approaching our, our second season as we're um, going to start production this month. That's terrific, congratulations. And is there anything that you want to say to set up the, the clip? Is it the, the trailer that you've got from season one or what is it that you want to show us today? We've sent in the, the 60 second trailer for the first season of Tribal and it outlines the strength of Jessica Madden who plays Sam Woodburn and um, outlines some of the obstacles that she's faced with. Excellent, let's take a look. You're a face and an ass and an Indian. Damn straight. And my Indian name is Runs With A Gun. What do you want to be called? How about Chief? So following that clip, why don't we why don't we just jump right in and, and continue talking about tribal for a minute? Um, so it's a concept that's really geared toward telling indigenous stories for indigenous indigenous audiences, but also for a much wider audience. Uh, so when you're creating the show, were there any creative touchstones that helped you to to anchor yourselves and and the audience in in what you wanted the show to be and to feel like? Were there, were there shows you said that we really, we want it to kind of feel like this, uh, but but put our own kind of twist on it? Well, I, I this was an interesting kind of combination. Uh, it's Genesis started um, with just observing that uh, a lot of major cities uh, in the US and Canada um, have reserves surrounding it. Mm. And I just found it very interesting how the, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, the way that they interact is very um, symbiotic a lot of times. And it just, you know, we're just brainstorming on, on what kind of crime drama could we give a fresh kind of progressive slant to that also had this kind of uh, governmental um, bureaucratic element to it that frustrates a lot of times. And at the same time, we wanted to create something that was entertaining and accessible to a non-Indigenous audience as well. So that, you know, uh, you know you'll know, you see in the casting of Brian Markinson, you know, it's been on Mad Men and, and just adds this whole, you know, interesting kind of thread and, and element to, to the cast. And then also, you know, we wanted to um, kind of take a, take a fresh look at some of the, the bigger issues that exist in the city, not just on the reserves. And so yeah. that was part of the, the genesis for that. I guess in, in creating the first season and now going into the second season, did you and the team um, spend time reflecting on the reality of making a show about you know, race and culture and policing in, in this moment? And how, how did you respond to that in the show? 
Yeah, it's quite incredible just the timing. Uh, we, you know, I think there's corruption exists everywhere. I don't think it's just exclusive to one uh, one country, one culture. And uh, we started reflecting, of course, way back during season when we were shooting season one, going, okay, so here's what here's what we're going to do to do in season two. And, and interestingly enough, a lot of those story points start to become, you know, headline news. And so you're going, wow. And then COVID hits. And then we're going, wow, we had to adjust some things there. And, uh, you know, I got quite excited, you know, without, you know, getting too um, gratuitous because, I mean, it, it can get really ugly. The true stories that are actually out there regarding uh, police you, misuse of uh, police authority and also, uh, you know, crimes that we haven't really seen before. So, so you know, obviously, over the last six to eight months, we've had a deviation from our original concepts into our actual script concepts because of current events. Then also because of COVID. So, it has been absolutely an interesting process uh, for me. Thank you. Um... I'm wondering uh, if we could talk a little bit about uh, Trickster for for a minute. Um, Gail, you uh, play, I mean, I would have I sort of think of you as a villain. I don't know whether or not you feel like that's uh, fair to say, but so you're you're you know starring as this this villain and trickster. You're getting ready to make your first feature film. Um, you are playing a really important role in a couple of feature films that are that are coming out right now, and and I really see you as as being wave of uh, new indigenous television and and cinema that's that's happening right now. So I'm just wondering for you what it's been like over the last couple of years, um, seeing all of these these people in the community and in, in including yourself getting these opportunities for the first time to, to tell our stories um, on a much larger stage than we've ever had the opportunity to before. Yeah, so last year, um, thank you for asking that because um, prior to last year, I, I hadn't worked as an actor for a long time. And then all of a sudden, it just boom, 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 boom. And not only um, that, but um, in Dennis's uh, film, I get to speak Cree, you know, Cree Mitchell. And um, I get, I, so I translated it, I, I spoke it, and there was other um, um, community members that came on and just to hear the language, to be able to act in the language was quite powerful. Um, yeah, it was quite powerful. And then um, when I got the part in Trickster and getting that chance as well to be, it's the first time I've ever been uh, like a regular in a series. And um, with that, no, I'm not a villain. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, to survive as we all are and my character is trying to survive mm. and and that's that's all she's trying to do and um hopefully it, it turn you know it'll come out it, the revelation will be there um but you know when you when you're trying to, sur to survive you do do it at all costs right um yeah so i'm i'm also um Right, I wrote, I wrote, and I'm directing, and I'm producing uh, my first feature drama, Rosie. And unfortunately, I've had to push it back to next year because of COVID. We were ready to go in May, June, like the instant, um, you know, the COVID insurance uh, was available. We were ready to go, but unfortunately, it came too late, and um, I had to push it. But so yeah, so. I love I love both being in front of and behind the camera and mm -hmm. being able to tell our stories in all in all in every way, just like Jennifer. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny you mention you know feeling like you were, well not not being cast so much in the last uh, last little while before Trickster and Night Raiders happened, and I was thinking about that when. Um, 
I was preparing for you to come on here and I thought like, oh man, you know, Gail has been around and has been such an incredible performer for a long time. Um, and there is this real passion and strength that is in you and, and that you communicate um, when, when you're on stage and when you're in front of the camera. And I just thought like, man, maybe we just needed to be at the right time in order to be ready for Gail <laughs> and, and, this, and this, this presence that, that you have to, to, to be on the screen and to be a little bit um, uh, larger than the kind of platform that you've had up until this point. So I'm, I'm very ready for it. <laughs> um, but we worked together way back when you were uh, just starting out. I love that. Yes, I, my, Gail was in my uh, fourth year student film when I was back in film school yeah. a million years ago. Um, but Gail, you mentioned uh, speaking in the language on, on Trickster, and I know that um, Jen, um, the, the language is really important for uh, Unsettled and is part of the way that the project was funded. So I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about the importance of, um, of making a show in the language, and, and it's the first scripted drama series in Canada to be um, in, in an Indigenous language. Yeah, it, um, you know, when the opportunity presented itself, I, ha I have done this twice before on a doc series, my series Future History. And it was, it was uh, challenging because it was a new and I don't speak the language. So, you know, there's a lot of barriers to uh, communication. But what I, what I learned from future history, I brought to Unsettled. And really what it was about was just saying, you know, let's not try to beat around the bush here. Let's just do what we're being asked to do, which is deliver uh, an episode where 4% of the content, the original content is in, the, in a language. And in this case, it was Ojibwe. So um, I actually went back to my future history cast and hired one of the language teachers who I just fell in love with, he's an amazing human being. And he, he sent in an audition, like I auditioned him. I went, you know, to him and put him on camera just to show the networks, but I knew that he was the character and it's a character who just doesn't speak English. He speaks only in Ojibwe. So we, it's a show that, you know, this character and other characters only speak in Ojibwe and sort of inter, um, interconnecting it to an English speaking show for a predominantly in English speaking audience. Um, it was an interesting experience, but I think what it helped do is really infuse it with the pacing, like the pacing of the language mm. gave it a very culturally specific pace and tone. And I don't think you would ever do the kinds of things that we were able to do in the show structurally um, without it being in another language. For sure. Well, and I saw a little bit of episode three today, and I think I, the, the actor that, that you're speaking about has so much warmth and presence that he brings to the screen. And, and it does make me think about when you, like, when you, when you hear natural language speakers, whether it's Nahiwewen or Anishinaabemowen or, or, or whatever the language is, um, when you hear those speakers speaking their language on screen, it feels so much different and it really grounds the show yeah. um, in, in, in a different sensibility than if you were just having people, you know, doing their best with, with, with speaking the language phonetically. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's different for sure. Um, I wanted to uh, ask about the idea of, of controversy, I guess, for, for um, Ron, for uh, Tribal and for uh, your previous show, Blackstone. I think that like the idea of, um, you know, both, both Blackstone and Tribal are shows that don't shy away from uh, talking about things that are really Im important and hard that are happening in, in Indigenous communities, but also in, in non-Indigenous communities. And I know that sometimes that gets in, into territory that's controversial for audiences. And I just wonder if there's, there's a kind of a dialogue in the show that's intentional um, as it relates to kind of like, building controversy or responding to controversy as a way of engaging the audience to think about these things that we're all thinking about and talking about in our real lives already. Um, so yeah, I just wonder if you could reflect on that. Well, <clears throat> I, 
you know, and I, I think that we, we know what Blackstone was and was created out of, you know, the, that kind of desire for to create a dialogue within communities and with non-Indigenous communities going, wow, I never knew that. I didn't even have a clue, you know, and it was confrontational. It was designed that way. And uh, it, it part of its narrative is, its successful narrative was that, you know, there was it was always difficult to talk about how Jen was on the show. And, uh, you know, we had a couple storylines that, you know, were just, you know, I, I think we never wanted to push it uh, over, over the edge, which I think can mm -hmm. be something done. And I think that the network, uh, when they came to me with, uh, you know, wanting to do uh, tribal, they wanted something less aggressive. <laughs> and so uh, as a content creator, you know, when, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, I wouldn't say a racehorse, but when you get pulled back on the reins, which happened, uh, what I did is, is I wanted to look at um, ways that we could introduce kind of, uh, you know, more complex issues within the community, like how the government sometimes deals with people, but it's still with a very entertaining gloss to it so that it didn't come off as, um, you know uh, that we were we were trying to to make a statement or to be controversial. We always tried to ground it in some form of authenticity within the engagement within a scene, so that it it wasn't you know just one side of the story, but it was also this side of the story. And we're we're doing that with uh, the pipelines, and we're introducing you know kind of dialogue on hereditary versus uh, electoral chiefs, and you know that's just stuff that the you know some of the audience just doesn't understand because it's so complicated. So, um, you know, it was never designed to be confrontational at the same time, uh, you know, we just witnessed uh, that there's a lot of people that still have opinions that maybe need to be updated, you know? And, you know, mm -hmm. if it could create a dialogue within, uh, you know, within our audience base, which is growing all the time, then I think that, you know, that narrative has value. Uh, and that's something that we always wanted to do with both shows. I think that the uh, tribal is a progression of what Blackstone started at the same time, uh, you know, it's a dramatic forum that needs, you know, some real grounding and authenticity. For sure. Well, and I think that that, that really does engage audiences. And if people are watching your show and saying like, you know, I think that that went too far, or I think it should go farther, or I, you know, I hate what this character did, or I love what this character did. That's that's all part of I think being being uh, being in the culture and engaging with the culture in in a real way. And I think it's it's important that creators find ways to do that. Um, Jen, I think that you know, in in your show, you similarly are are talking about things that are happening in the communities in 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 a real way. Um, and so what for you is important about, I think, fi like finding that, um, finding that line, I guess, between um, talking about issues that are important and realities that are important in our communities that might be difficult and, um, and engaging people versus, I guess, being controversial or kind of like poking the bear. Do you have a, like a, a gut sense for, for yourself when, when you're developing something? You know, for, for this show, I've been down that controversial road. I, you know, when we were doing Moccasin Flats 20 years ago, I yeah. had to seek out, you know, Laura and I were seeking out advice from elders because there was no framework for or context for these conversations. And we were just like, is it okay that we're talking about this stuff? Like youth mm. prostitution, childhood prostitution? This is real in the community and, you know, is it okay? So similarly yeah. to that kind of work in Unsettled, um, my my process was very different because I'm a lot older now and more experienced and I would say wiser that for me, I, I believe that a lot of the issue driven sort of concepts need to be found at an intersection of opinions and perspectives. So I'm the kind of writer who has a lot of a lot of consultants. Hmm. reading and researching and vetting and multiple hmm. perspectives because when you talk about like the child welfare system from an indigenous perspective and reclaiming our you know our ownership and identity around children in care 
you can't just go and ask the person who's going to give you the answer that you want, right? right? The answer that you want ultimately as a storyteller is the one that makes you the most uncomfortable. So I think as a writer, that was really, really important to me. But again, you know, it brings up a lot of other questions about um, integrity and, and uh, authenticity that, you know, is probably a conversation that is just a whole other 20 panels because these are things that we're only learning, right? As we're, as we're going through the process. So yeah, it was important to me to have, you know, I had probably 20 people in my sort of immediate circle that were from uh, experts in various area, areas with various opinions. For sure. Yeah, and those, and those answers are all gonna be different for, for different people. Um, so, and the thing that, that is bringing us all here today is, is all of your uh, Indigenous shows. And I know that, that over the years, um, probably all of us in different ways have been told by different um, people in different positions, different gatekeepers, that audiences aren't necessarily going to be interested in uh, stories featuring Indigenous characters or stories that take place in Indigenous communities. Uh, and that might be even more true um, when our stories try to go out into international audiences. So I wondered if, um, Elise, if you could speak to um, a little bit of the, the early success of Trickster and, and why you think that Trickster is, is really um, crossing those barriers and resonating with uh, non-Indigenous communities, because it's such a Heisla story, but it's also a story that's um, really resonating with a lot of people who aren't Heisla, obviously. <laughs> I think, um, you know, Trickster is created by Michelle Latimer and Tony Elliott, and Michelle originally brought to Sienna Films these books by Eden to say, how can we make this happen? Can we work together? And one of the things that we always thought right away about the books and the story was that it would be this adaptation that could appeal to such a broad audience because it's in this genre that is really popular, you know, like Gail referenced Stranger Things, and it is that kind of intersection of coming of age and the supernatural, um, but it's from this really specific point of view um, that people haven't seen. So it's bringing something new to, you know, kind of a broader Canadian audience and a broader international audience, but within the framework of a story that people really like and that there's built in audiences and tribals similarly by using a police procedural, but just putting this really authentic and distinct point of view on it, you you get something that feels really fresh, but that people can really understand and relate to. Um, and I think the other thing that people are really responding well to about the show, um, that's for everyone, is the, um, the, the characters and the cast um, and the heart and soul that they're bringing to that, because these are stories, you know, Trickster has um, monsters and magic um, and, and those elements to it. But really it's a story about a boy growing up and his family like and community, the people who he cares about and who care about him. And I think that that travels so well. So mm -hmm. um, it's that intersection of, of, of genre and point of view, I think um, that's really popular. And Michelle uh, has always referenced folk horror in relation to the, to the ways that you, that you can take these really specific um, cultural traditions, cultural mythologies, and spin that out in a way that, you know, anyone anywhere in the world, regardless of their background can really relate to. And I think Trickster's in that tradition and that's what's speaking to a broader audience about it. And I, I wonder for the other creators on the panel, if you can speak to um, your awareness when when you're writing, when you're when you're building the show uh, of audience, you know, who it is that the show is for, who it is that you're speaking to. I think that, you know, sometimes when people are making a feature film, for example, you can you can focus your audience down to saying, like, I want I am making this movie for my dad. And my family and my and my community right around me, but because television is just such a, a much more expensive proposition, um, you have to broaden that audience a little bit. And so I just wonder how you balance that um, creatively when you're when you're building the show to know like, okay, this is this is how we're going to um, reach that core indigenous audience. I mean, for for um, you, Ron and, and Janet, working with uh, APTN, um, and then also making 
making sure that the show is going to speak to that 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 broader audience outside. Well, what was interesting just about Tribal's Genesis, as I was saying earlier, uh, there was two broadcasters kind of involved at at the beginning. So, you know, uh, and then one just kind of uh, fell out of the um, the mix for unknown reasons. But we had a tonality and a narrative that was kind of, uh, I wouldn't say commissioned, but it was, we were given a time slot, actually. And so mm -hmm. that dictates as a content creator a lot. Uh, when, you know, uh, Blackstone, as an example, was developed with a uh, showcase with television without borders. So there was nothing there, you know. So, so those were, you know, there was a very different kind of genesis and a process. Uh, and especially... Uh, with getting, you know, how deep do we go? How dark do we go? Those are questions, you know, that really shade the show. And, uh, you know, I think we found it struck a really, a really fine balance. And we really strive hard to, uh, to not go over that edge, where um, I think, like you said, with a feature, or another show that I have, where I didn't have those parameters, definitely is huge for, uh, you know, making those big, large creative decisions so early on. Mm. I think for me, it's, um, you know, this process was so deeply personal. And I feel like a lot of it was being guided by, you know, who, who am I writing for myself? For my community, for the community at large, you know, not just specifically my community, but all of our you know, the, the larger Indigenous community, because I think that a lot of these stories are, regardless of what community you're from, are, are so relatable and essential to be, um, you know, looking at in a new way, you know, in a way that's maybe a little bit um, lighter in tone, while the situations still remain very, um, you know, large on the issue level. Um, but ultimately I rely on my network like TVO and, you know, not so much APTN because that's the indigenous audience, but I, I would rely yeah. on TVO to dictate what's working and what's not for their audience that they know so well. I'm wondering if um, just as we're kind of wrapping up, if you can, if anyone has any reflections on, on what you feel like indigenous creators have to contribute to um, the different global conversations that we're having right now around um, environment, politics. Uh, we spoke a little bit about about race and policing and culture. Um, now that that indigenous creators are are creating um, uh, dramatic scripted series entertainment for a larger audience, you know, what do you think it is that indigenous creators are going to be bringing to that conversation that um, is is new or that we haven't seen before? Well, for, for me, um, when I was doing, uh, um, trying to figure out the character, Michelle uh, told me, um, just think about the environment being poisoned. And um, sure, in Trickster, there's like the pipelines are, you know, very much um, in, in the storyline and the destruction of the earth. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's woven in there in a lot of um, Indigenous stories because the land is like we, we are, the land is always inside of us, no matter where we are in the world, right? The land is always inside of us and we're always aware, we're always, we're all one, we're all connected, we're, we're, we're not separate from the trees, the animals, anything, we're, 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 we're just part of creation and that's what um i think i feel that our stories have to offer and hopefully people will um you know embrace that they'll see that oh, okay it's not just um it's not just the earth it's not it's not a thing separate from us if the where if the earth bleeds we bleed you know it's it's like it's it's such a different way of seeing the world. That's how, um, yeah. You know, I'm gonna, gonna continue on that riff because I think what I, my opinion on it is very similar to what she's saying, but in a, from a different kind of perspective is that, 
like language. And I've been told so many times by various speakers and elder elders and knowledge keepers that inside the language are codes. It's coded into an entirely different worldview. So when you connect to your language, you're unlocking you know, coding that you've never experienced before. And it expresses the world around you in a way that is so unbelievably like magical and, and magnificent. Um, in many ways, it connects you, reconnects you back to that source, right? So I think that indigenous storytellers, what we will bring and what the rest of all of us will bring is, um, you know, a key that will unlock a new worldview in, you know, and there's endless number of keys that need to be shared <laughs> with the world to unlock new perspectives and worldviews and coding that is embedded inside of us that has been there always, but we just haven't been able to access it. Adam, can we, um, I mean, we all said our name and uh, what uh, series or what our, 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 uh, our story is, but can we mm -hmm. say our nations and where we're, where we're from? Sure, yeah, do you wanna start us off? Okay, so, okay, sure. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm a Cree Métis, uh, and I, 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 I'm so happy, and I'm so proud of my grandma for speaking my language, Cree Michif, and I'm from northern Saskatchewan in a small little village called Beauval, and that's me. Amazing. Ron? I'm a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta, and my family is from the, uh, from the Chippewan um, and Cree in Northern Alberta and the Northwest Territories. And um, yeah, I, uh, I grew up in a very interesting part Cree, part white world. And that's why uh, I reflect on uh, that kind of intersection and those contradictions and those misunderstandings. So, you know, I, I really applaud the, the other two shows that are just represented here because uh, just to speak into the progression of Indigenous storytelling in Canada is, is remarkable. And this is this is, this is gaining a lot of momentum. I've been, you know, I'm sure as everyone has been fielding uh, several opportunities and just seeing how much interest in this world uh, Indigenous storytelling is. And mm. so I'm just thankful to be part of it and thankful to be part of this panel with, uh, with so much talent represented here. Thank you. Uh, Janet? I totally, I completely, completely agree. I'm a huge supporter. I'm here as a fan. Um, I think that it's beautiful sentiment, what uh, Gail and Jennifer spoke about with regards to sharing Indigenous stories. Um, I think storytelling brings insight and perspective um, across our nation. And I'm, a really, I'm just really proud to be a part of it. Well, thank you. And, and Jen, tell us where, where you're from. I'm born and raised in Toronto uh, with roots in Muscopeding First Nation, where my mother is from in Saskatchewan, near the Capel Valley. And my father is born in Israel and uh, raised in Canada in Toronto. And I was raised in Toronto as a urban, half Ojibwe, half Israeli kid. And that's where all my storytelling chutzpah comes from. <laughs> Uh, how about you, Elise? Um, Elise Settler from Ontario. <laughs> um, I was so happy to be uh, included in the conversation. Yeah, well, uh, thank you all so much for participating today. Um, I'm uh, Korean Métis from Edmonton, and uh, I'm living in, in Toronto these days. So um, I think it's a really nice way to close by reminding ourselves and each other and everyone where where all of us uh, all of us come from um, but uh, I just want to say again on behalf of uh, telefilm the Canada Media Fund uh, thanks so much for attending today and I can't wait to see more of your shows Yay. thank you <laughs>